Good afternoon, and welcome to uh, our, our discussion about TensorFlow, which is a, an exciting new framework and toolkit from Google. I've got some good news, and I've got some bad news. The good news is it's an incredibly powerful toolkit. It does some really, really cool things. Um, if you know what you're doing, it will enable you to, to do some, some pretty cool stuff in the machine learning space. The bad news is if you don't have a background in machine learning, um, it may be completely useless to you. Uh, that being said, I want to try to contextualize it. I want to try to help you understand what it does for you. I want to put it into the larger workflow of a machine learning and data science activity. Um, and at the end of the slides, which I will get to the conference organizers, uh, I have my email address. And if you don't have a background in machine learning and are interested in sort of next steps, uh, I do encourage you to drop me a line and I'll try to push you in the right direction in terms of books and videos and courses and things like that. We, we're seeing lots of toolkits like this be released by Google, by Microsoft, by Facebook, by Amazon. And a lot of people are sort of, sort of curious, like why would they, if these are so powerful, why would they give them away? And I think the answer comes down to a couple of things. Number one, without good data, it's pretty useless. Right? A lot of companies are heading down the machine learning path thinking, oh, we can take um, these magical tools and our crap data and produce good results. And that won't happen. If you do not have good data, if you do not have enough data or enough data of the right type, these kinds of toolkits are not going to be all that helpful to you. So there's a lot of excitement um, and, and people pursuing this without understanding the, the appropriate path towards benefiting from something like this. So number one, without good data, the tools themselves are just commodities. They're, they're algorithms encoded into useful libraries. Number two, um, there's, there's a, a war for mindshare, particularly on the hiring front, particularly on the hiring of machine learning experts front. And so Microsoft and Google and Amazon are, are interested in having researchers use their toolkits um, so that they are able to hire people who understand the tools that they're using. <coughs> Excuse me, more easily. And then the third reason I think that they're giving these away is because they want their own developers to, to be comfortable using them. And some of the early initiatives, say Google did with uh, the disbelief stuff, um, were useful from a predictive perspective, but the developer experience was not all that hot. And so I think by giving these tools away to other developers, they will get feedback that will make them more useful environments for perhaps non-machine learning expert developers who, who understand kind of what they're doing, but um, are sort of more traditional developers. And so TensorFlow sort of falls into that space where if you have good data, if you know what you're doing, um, it, it can be a useful technology. Now, there are other ones out there, but what makes TensorFlow different is it moves beyond the training phase. And I'll talk about the training phase a, a little bit more in just a minute. It's not just about building the models, it's also about operationalizing them, optimizing them, and supporting a variety of architectures such that we can run portions of the application on a phone or on an iPad or tablet or something like that. And we do not have to hand down the huge uh, models that were created during the training phase. So it's got support not just to help you figure out the models from your data, but then also how to turn them into uh, production systems. And one of the things that people often don't think about is once you generate the models, if you retrain them in the future, you don't want to just drop them in place into your production system because you could completely tank the quality of your predictions un unexpectedly. So TensorFlow, through some of its uh, surrounding technologies, also has the ability to do some A-B testing on models to make sure that they're, they're, the new versions, the new retrained versions, are seeing the same kind of quality predictions that you were seeing in the past. Um, briefly, my, my background in machine learning uh, started about 18 years ago when I worked for a, uh, a company that built an internet distributed computing platform. So think SETI at home, but a general purpose preemptive Java-based uh, ecosystem for taking advantage of idle computers all over the world. And so we were trying to build a platform to allow cheap, cost-effective computation for computationally expensive learning tools that were starting to emerge at the time. Um, and the, the company did not succeed in, in creating that platform uh, as, as a marketplace, but they've also moved on and done some very interesting vertical things as well. So 
again, about 18 years ago, we were doing things like exhaustive regressions with uh, genetic algorithm-based feature selection and uh, Monte Carlo-based digital rendering and, and things like that. And so um, I worked on the infrastructure, and this was like pre-J2EE and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we also had a labs group that was doing some of these machine learning techniques, and, and that was where I was first exposed to it. And so over time, I've, I've gotten more into it and um, have, have had a lot of fun along the way. And so seeing tools like TensorFlow emerge uh, help the learning curve quite a, quite a lot, but there is still a, a quite steep learning curve. So let's talk a bit about the data science and machine learning process. Everyone's excited. I mean, you cannot, you cannot look online on Twitter or blog posts or things these days without seeing people getting excited about machine learning and AI and data science. And one of the things that nobody really goes out of their way to point out is, you know, even though this is one of the sexiest jobs of the 21st century, um, and we have all these sort of dark arts uh, machine learning tools available to us, that really represents only one part of the process, right? A lot of the process of what we go through involves sweeping and mopping. So get ready, Rockstar, grab a mop, because you're going to have a lot of cleaning to do. Because a lot of data that we have is just not in a good enough shape. So a very common activity for a data scientist is to collect some data from the world, clean it up, produce a report, and there we go. There's no real analysis necessary. We don't, we don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about things like web analytics. Now, if you want to start building models and predictions about how to drive web analytics, then things start to get a little bit more interesting, and then we have to perhaps go into what we call exploratory data analysis, which is a fancy way of saying you're going to screw around for a while, right? Because you don't necessarily know what the right technique to use is. You don't necessarily know what aspects of your data are going to be the, the best to, um, to do the training and learning phases on. So you're going to do some, some um, feature engineering. You're going to go through and play around with these things. If you have the ability to use some of the deep learning techniques and platforms, these are helping with sufficient amounts of data, helping us do some of the feature extraction in a more automatic way. But without that, you're going to have to spend a lot of time um, playing around and seeing what works. So there's equal parts art and science involved in this process. At the end of the day, once you think you're sort of ready to go, then engaging the learning algorithms, the machine learning capabilities <coughs> can be a successful strategy and help find patterns and build predictive models and whatnot that we wouldn't know necessarily how to build or explain from scratch um, as programmers. We, instead, we, we create tools and ecosystems that allow them to sort of learn from the data and the characteristics that we have. And so at the end of the day, there are basically two main outputs for a data science activity like this. One is to tell a story, try to change somebody's mind, right? whether this is science or trying to build a data-driven organization and decide wh where the organization should move next. In that case, you're, you're trying to change people's minds. The analytical tools that you're using probably have to have a pretty high explanatory uh, capability. right? You have to be able to explain how you came to the conclusions that you came to. And some of the high-dimensional clustering sorts of things that work uh, but are impossible to explain would not be a useful tool there. So if you're trying to help people understand where they need to go or the decisions that they need to make, then you're going to have to translate it into sort of terms that your audience will understand and have your process uh, be able to explain what you're doing. Now, other times we want to release some kind of tool back to the world and then use that tool in some sort of predictive way. And that's where the, the, the support operationalizing and productizing A-B testing capabilities of TensorFlow really shine. And most uh, machine learning tools will help you through this phase and then say, OK, you're on your own from here on out to try to figure out how to operationalize this. As I said, that's where TensorFlow really kind of shines is that it has tools for quantizing the data sets and reducing the size of the models and supporting arbitrary architectures. They're doing cool stuff with like the uh, word lens capability where you can take your phone, point it at a sign, and translate it visually on your screen you know, from models that it's, it's interacting with on the back end. So that's, that's where TensorFlow really shines, is, is in its inability to build runtime production systems. Other kinds of systems that you're familiar with, obviously search, 
uh, is, is driven by some of the machine learning models that we have. Uh, spam filters are another example of a data product that we train and then release back into the world. But anything with some kind of predictive model, uh, you're, you're going to want to be able to uh, turn back into running software and have a strategy for treating it um, like you do with regression testing on software. You want to be able to regression test model tweaks and, and whatnot. So TensorFlow sort of grew out of the Google Brain team. As I said, they had some earlier releases called Disk Belief um, that had pretty good predictive results, but the development experience wasn't um, all that great. 1.0 was released in February, and they, they kind of broke the APIs in subtle but annoying ways. Um, I, I will say overall, they made good choices, and they standardized and cleaned up the APIs. But all the books and tutorials and things that have come out in the last two years <coughs> suddenly did not work anymore without understanding how to rename some of these functions and capabilities. And so that was, that was a bit of a drag for people new to the, to the platform to be able to, to be successful early on without a lot of headache. They've, they've moved on and we're seeing more uh, 1.0 plus compliant tutorials and examples and things coming out now. Uh, ten, version 1.2 was just recently released, so that's two relatively strong releases since February. There's a lot of momentum behind this. If you Google uh, TensorFlow Developer Summit, there's a whole series of like 15 to 20 hours of videos talking about um, aspects of how it works, how people are using it, a lot of fun kinds of examples as well. So there's, there's a lot of material for you to, to play with. Um, but basically, TensorFlow is a fairly low-level toolkit for doing complicated math in the support of machine learning, uh, deep learning, deep neural network capabilities. It's targeting researchers who know what they're doing to build experimental um, learning architectures to play around with them and to turn them into running software. Now, it's, it is a data flow graph-based system, right? So we're, we're going to define these graphs, and these graphs are going to represent arbitrarily complex kinds of operations. And then we will invoke those graphs within some kind of runtime session that will pass data into it, attach them to computational devices like CPUs or GPUs, and um, in, in newer releases also then allow you the capacity to be able to create the jobs and then schedule them against distributed nodes. So you can take advantage of clustered uh, technology or clustered instances of CPUs and GPUs as well. The nodes themselves represent operations like addition, multiplication, uh, solving certain kinds of problems. We'll see lots of little examples of this. And then the data in the shape of what we call tensors flows through the nodes as part of an uh, invocation of, of the, the run activity on a session. One of the nice things, even though it is fairly low level, it does abstract up above the kinds of coding that you have to do with an OpenCL or a CUDA kind of interface to CPUs and GPUs. In this case, you define the graphs, and the graphs themselves can generally be scheduled to CPUs or GPUs um, either automatically or you can have complete control over it if you want to be able to do that. But the, the programmatic interface is not all that different. And so it's, 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 a, it's an abstraction above sort of low-level GPGPU, general purpose uh, GPU computing. Um, but operationally, it's still a fairly low-level API, and so people are building higher-level abstractions on top of it, so you have to do less code to take advantage of it. As I said, now we're able to do distribution across clusters as well. It's got ecosystems of tools that surround it in terms of, as I said, uh, optimizing the models, visualizing the graphs, seeing what the workflow is going to look like, seeing what the results are doing as well. And we'll, we'll touch upon many of these. So you should do this if you want to play around with some new machine learning capabilities, build some models, uh, if you want to iterate on your model testing strategy in an exploratory data analysis phase, this is a great tool for that. Um, Compared to trying to write this stuff by hand in C++ or, or whatnot, um, it's a lot easier. One thing I should point out, the training phase is uh, still, I believe, uh, completely Python-based. So if you're not familiar with Python, that, that may be a bit of a hurdle. The runtime operational models can be deployed into C++, JavaScript, Java, Go, other kinds of operational characteristics. Uh, but the training phase is still going to require you to be functionally uh, capable with Python. Um, as I said, the, the A-B testing support is really useful. So if you want to say, how does it work if we do this? How does it work if we do that? 
you can take the same inputs and run them through different models simultaneously and see what the answers look like as a way of deciding when, when you've done well enough, when your predictions are uh, successful enough to move forward. All right, so the name tensor is really just a fancy abstraction over an n-dimensional matrix. Part of the, the focus is that the APIs do not change substantively when we're doing um, scalars or one-dimensional or two-dimensional kinds of matrices. So three is a rank zero tensor, one, two, three is a rank one tensor with a shape of three, three, uh, three values. We have, we have arrays of arrays, uh, arrays of matrices for rank two tensors. But again, the APIs, when we say add these two things together, it doesn't matter as long as the shapes are similar, they'll, the uh, underlying capabilities will, will do that for you. So we don't have four or five different ways of doing the same thing. <clears throat> we see this visualization, and I know it's hard to see up here, um, but this is tensor board showing you the graph of operations and as your, as your systems run, it can dump everything to a log so you can go back and visualize after the fact and sort of see how the learning process um, accumulated over time. So this is one of the nice things that comes with it and we'll see some smaller examples that are easier to read. Installing TensorFlow simply, like just out of the box, here's the Linux installation, here's the Mac OS installation, is relatively straightforward. <clears throat> if you do need to get into more um, tweaked configurations to take advantage of GPUs and things like that. It is more detail-oriented. I will say, uh, even though there are several steps, the, the handful of times that I have installed this on multiple platforms, it always works, as long as you're sort of careful and pay attention. Uh, but it, it can be more complicated to, to tweak it to take advantage of, of GPUs and whatnot. But the simple installations are, are as straightforward as pretty much anything else. So let's look at some basic operations. <clears throat> this is Python. So in a Python environment, whether it's in a command line session like this or through a Jupyter Notebooks or something, um, you can import TensorFlow as TF. As long as it works, your configuration and installation is, is pretty happy. And then you can interact with the TensorFlow API to create a couple constants. So it's got the, the typical data types that you would expect, uh, floats, ints, Booleans, strings, things like that. In this case, we're creating two nodes. One is a constant with a value three, and we can tell it what type it is. Another time, you can give it a value, and it'll infer the type from the value. Now, at this point, we have nodes in our graph, right? But they're not actually going to execute until we attach them to a session. So if I say, you know, print out nodes one and two, we'll see that they are uh, constant sized, uh, uh, constant shaped tensors but the actual values aren't evaluated until it's part of a session. So we need to create a session. So in this case, I'm creating a local session. The computer that this is running on has two uh, GPUs, two GeForce GTX 1080s, um, which I got to, to take to conferences like this, and I, I paid attention to all the numbers to put together a really nice computer, except the weight. <laughs> and, Two GTX 1080s uh, is like a 20 pound uh, notebook, which is kind of hard to take on airplanes and things. So uh, alas, I will show you outputs from running on these things without actually having that computer here. You'll notice that it identifies the various GPUs that are available to it. Um, it can take advantage of these in its own scheduling algorithms, or you can also take control and schedule operations to particular uh, computing devices, whether it's the CPU, or uh, one of your GPUs. But at this point we have a session and we can then say run and evaluate the, the two nodes in that session and at that point we see the values of three and four printed out, right? Because we, are, we have a context, the context is attached to a computational device, we're able to evaluate the, the default graph in this case which just has these two nodes in it. Now, you can build more complex nodes so I can create a new node that is based on creating an adder of the two constant nodes that we've seen so far. So at this point, we've created a new node in the graph, and if I run that against the session, it will, it'll, it'll show you, this is obviously visualized with uh, TensorBoard, 
We have two constant inputs. We have the adder. And if we run that through um, the session, it will print out the values 7. Now, one of the nice things that TensorFlow does to make the development easier is it's got operator overloading. So a lot of, you know, I think two to three dozen operators have been overloaded, so you do not have to manipulate the graph directly. You could just say, run node 1 plus node 2, and that will create the equivalent unnamed adder function for you in, in the current default graph. And the, the results are obviously the same. Um, we don't want constants in most, for the most part. We want to be able to pass data into our graphs. So we can have placeholders. In this case, I can say I'm going to have a placeholder that I'm going to call A, and it's going to be a floating point number. I'll have another placeholder called B, and I'll create an adder that will add those two things together. So again, we're invoking the operational overloading to create a graph that has the adder and the two placeholders. And again, this represents a structure of computation. It's not until we actually pass data into it as part of a running session that it'll execute. So now, with this adder node in place, I could say, pass in a dictionary and assign the value 3 to A and 4.5 to B, and obviously the value is 7.5. But I could also pass in a different shaped tensor, in this case, uh, 1, 1, 3, and 2, 4, and then it'll add the, the tensor, the matrices together. The operational interaction with the graph is, is identical. So this is, this is where the tensor abstraction over different shaped data becomes uh, useful and friendly to developers. We can take these nodes and we can save them off. We can use them in different parts of the graph structure. And so in this case, if I wanted to do something with the adder node uh, by tripling the result, then here's another operational uh, overload where the graph would be manipulated to have a multiplier to take the output of the adder node and multiply it by a new constant. So now the graph is extending. We could pass in our placeholder values. They, the value get added together. That serves as an input. And then the, there's a constant that's associated with it to, to have the, the, the ultimate um, activity. So in this case, we're going to add and triple, run the add and triple node through the session, pass in the values 3 and 4.5. 7.5 times 3 is going to be 22.5. Now, TensorBoard, I said, is going to help us visualize these graphs. Obviously, these are very simple graphs. So as they get more complicated, um, we're going to want to be able to see what's happening. So here we see two constants. I can, you can provide your own names for them. You can multiply those things together. You can create some more nodes with their own uh, names in them, build a session, run the session. And then we're going to dump the results of the session graph into a directory using what's called a summary writer close the writer, close the session, and now we can start up TensorBoard pointing to the directory where we dumped out the logs and navigate to it through a browser, and we'll see, in this case, the, the shape of the graph, and depending on the events that you fire, um, activities of evaluation of the graph. So these are the kinds of things that you can do um, with TensorFlow from a fairly low level. Let's look at some more complicated examples. I will try to explain this. If you do not have a background in machine learning, um, I apologize. But what we're going to do is we're going to build a linear model. And a linear model can be used to make predictive purposes. It can be used as a classifier. And so in this case, we're going to say, I don't want placeholders. I want what are called variables. And the reason we want the variables is because as we iterate over um, models in learning phases, the, the variables will get updated, whereas uh, the other, the, the placeholders and things get reset um, each time we pass through the graph. And so in this case, I want to take the weight, uh, uh, the weight value and the bias value, because ultimately our line is weight times x plus b, or in its more familiar form, y equals mx plus b. The y value is equal to the slope times the x input plus the, the y-intercept. So in this case, we're building up a linear model we're seeding it with two values that for our x inputs are going to be wrong. So the results are not going to look great. But the whole point is we want to then learn what these values should be and then build a predictive model from the, the data that we pass through it. So in this case, we're going to say, let's set the weighting, um, 
variable to 0.3 and the, the, the bias to negative 0.3, build a linear model out of multiplying that weight times our placeholder x values, add in the bias, and now we can um, go about running this. Variables have to be initialized. So here we run the global variables initializer, and then they are not uh, reset until you explicitly reset them. The init that is created here is another node that has to be executed in a session. So we initialize the, the variables by running that node in the session, and that can obviously get uh, arbitrarily complex. And then we can run the linear model and interpret, interpret, interpret it for the values one, two, three, four uh, for x. So we're gonna pass in each one of those x's, run it through the weight times the x plus the bias, and generate these results. Now, without doing some visualization or whatnot, it would be hard for us to sort of get a sense of whether these, these are good results for that linear model based on our data. So if we say, okay, here's some sample data that should work with that, we're gonna pass in the values zero, negative one, negative two, negative three. To have a learning phase, you generally are gonna to have to have what we call a loss function or an error function, and we wanna see how far off we are then the learning phase is gonna to try to minimize how wrong we are. So in this case, squared deltas, I wanna see for each of the x values and the y values how far off we are. We square it because you could be off in either direction and we don't want that to, to um, play into it. So I'm gonna build a, from the linear model minus the y values a squared deltas node and I wanna reduce that down to a flat value and so when I take my inputs, one, two, three, four, and these y values for the linear model that was set up with the wrong weighting and bias, we see that we're off by quite a lot, right? Those are the wrong uh, weight and bias um, parameters for that model for seeing the, the data that we have. So what we wanna do now is we want to train that to find the right weighting models. Just to show you what will happen when we get there, if we reassign W and B to be the correct values of negative one and one, which is not how you do machine learning, right? You don't tell it what the answers are and then say, okay, we're done. But we see if we have the right answers in there and we rerun our loss function with those values, we now see that we have zero um, error, right? These are the correct models for those X and Ys. Uh, these are the right parameters for those X and Ys with our linear model. Now to get there, we're gonna use some kind of optimizer. And a very, very common optimizer um, in machine learning is called gradient descent. Um, it's a way of looking at the error curve and determining when you're at the minimum. So how, how, how much less wrong can I be if, I, if I'm able to um, iterate over this? So I tweak the results, am I less wrong? Tweak the results, am I less wrong? So that approach, um, is going to then try to minimize the loss function for our linear model. We can then say for our session, initialize the variables, iterate a thousand times, train it against that data set, and without more data, you know, we're not gonna get uh, to the perfect results, but we can see now if we execute and run this, the, the uh, weighting has been reassigned to negative 0.9999, which is roughly the negative one that we hand put in there, and 0.999, which is roughly the 1.0 that we put in there to correct the results. So the, the point is, with the training data, with our linear model, we've used an optimizer to minimize the, the result. So that's, that's kind of how machine learning works, at least one type of machine learning. Um, you feed data in, you, you let it try to become less wrong, you generate the model, and then the model can be used for some kind of predictive or classifying purpose. We see fairly complex graph structures created behind the scenes by just simply invoking the use of the optimizer over the loss function. Now, let's look at how this actually works in practice, right? What are the kinds of things that you can do with this? And I'm not gonna go into the details of exactly what's going on behind the scenes, but operationally, I think you'll understand what's happening and, and how this is useful. Now this example comes from a, a professor who, who works in this space, and he's got some really cool blogs about learning different machine learning uh, frameworks. He, he puts them through the same kinds of uh, tests and sort of sees like, well, 
how hard is it to get up and running? How easy is it to verify the results? And so he's intentionally going to create data of a particular shape and then try to see how TensorFlow uses it, um, how, how TensorFlow um, lets you figure out, say, a linear classifier or a neural network classifier for this. So the first kind of data that he's going to create looks like this. And what's interesting about this is most of the values are on one side and the other values are on the other side, which means we could build a linear classifier down the middle and be able to say, all right, here's a new data input. Which side do you end up on? I'm going to categorize you as this side versus that side. So if this is good customer, bad customer, good credit risk, bad credit risk, whatever your categories are, a linear classifier would work very well for this data. Now, this is not real data. This is, this is data that's shaped intentionally this way for his, his testing purposes. But with that data in a spreadsheet, he's able to run, he's, he's got his little Python uh, script. He's using a classifier called softmax, which takes a series of values, turns them into a probability distribution that adds up to one, and then says, okay, what's the most likely uh, category? So when we have two of these things, it's basically going to say, oh, you're, you're this category or you're that category. So with the training data, with the, the simulated data, uh, we, he says, let's use five training sessions, print out verbosely. We see it go through the training process. We see it generate the weight matrix and the bias vector for a linear classifier. So now we're trying to operationalize the kind of thing that we just did um, for, the, for the heck of it. And we'll see now that the line that's generated accurately with 100% accuracy is able to categorize that data set. So obviously real data wouldn't be, look quite like that, but this is an example of, of going through the process of being able to accurately predict that. So that's the expected result, right? If you have data that is nicely linear classifiable, you should be able to get a very good result to classify the results. How well do you think a linear classifier would do on this data set? Not nearly as well, right? That doesn't mean we can't try it, right? So we, we can try, these are, he, he calls these the moons, the, inter, the intersecting moons data sets. If we say, use the same softmax classifier, give it 100 chances, you know, 100 training sessions to go through, um, we see that we come up with an accuracy of 0.861. That may be a passing grade in school, but that's a pretty poor result from a machine learning mechanism. Now, you'll see, like we get a lot of the data right because most of it falls on one side and most of it falls on the other, but these things that are sort of in the middle and either side of the line is where our inaccuracy comes from. So basically, a linear classifier would be a bad uh, attempt here. So what we can do instead is to try to use a neural network with a hidden layer to find a nonlinear classifier that based on the shape of the data, um, we'll, be able to, we'll be able to intuit that shape and be able to use that from a classification purpose. And we can see we're able to very quickly jump that up to 0.97, which is a much stronger predict prediction capability, and it's going to look something like that. Now, there's a lot that goes into this, into this process when you go through the training process. You want, you want to avoid overfitting where you're basically reflecting the shape of the training data and not generalizing well to um, data that you haven't seen yet. That's, that's all part of being a disciplined machine learning uh, expert. But in this case, where he's just trying to learn the framework and learn how to come to conclusions that he's expecting, <clears throat> it's a relatively straightforward process to, to get to this point. Now, here's a final data set, um, again, how well do you think a linear classifier would do here? Probably not well at all, right? So let's try and we see that we get an accuracy of 0.43, right? It just, it doesn't work well because of, of the shape of the data. But by using his hidden learner, because of the, the way the data is shaped, it's actually able to get a 1.0, 100% accuracy by building a nonlinear um, model that looks like an amoeba, but accurately reflects the the shape of the, the training data. So these are the kinds of things that you're going to do with, with um, TensorFlow. He's obviously just trying to test it out, you know, take it out for a spin and sort of see what, it, what it's like, but you're gonna have data, 
you're going to train models, you're going to test it against its uh, predictive capabilities, then you're going to want to take that and, and operationalize it somehow. We don't have time to go into all that, but I just I want you to understand procedurally what it is that we're trying to do. So let's look at some, some fun examples that, that are possible here as well. Um, there's a, this is coming straight from the TensorFlow tutorial. There's a set of scripts in, in the uh, TensorFlow models GitHub repo that you can check out. And um, using what is called the Inception V3 model, which is a model that was trained off of, I think, 14 million images and has a, what we call a top five error rate in the low single digits. I can't remember exactly what it is. It's like 3%. Um, tremendously successful way of op uh, identifying individual um, objects within a scene. So this is, this is doing much more complicated deep learning kinds of things behind the scenes, but these are all tools that are available to you in TensorFlow, and you can walk through it. So to do this kind of thing yourself, just clone the repo, uh, go into the ImageNet directory, and within there, there's a script that allows you to run against an image. And if you don't provide an image, it will use its default chip, which in this case is obviously a panda. And so if you say, run classify image and don't give it something to do, it will say, oop, sorry, um, it will say, yep, we think this is a panda and the score is off the side of the screen, but it's very high, right? So you say, okay, well, that's your test image. I hope you get that right. Um, what happens if you provide something that, um, you know, obviously it looks like a, a you know, canonical panda. What happens if you give it something with two things in it? Well, under the hood, it's using convolutional neural networks, which are mimicking how the eye works. It's finding edge detection and patterns and finding out like mathematically what's the most important part of the scene. So in this case, we have a flamingo and a duck, and it turns around and says, 84, you know, 0.84 confidence, I think that's a flamingo, right? It just kind of ignores the duck, but that is a canonical flamingo, right? Shape, color-wise, et cetera. So I thought, okay, well, what happens if we run something that's less canonical? So most pugs, the dog, are, in my estimation, uh, black and tan. So I thought, what happens if you give it a, a pug that uh, is all one color, right? Again, keep in mind, the model is based on the images that have been passed into the network. So if there weren't a lot of uh, pictures of, of all black pugs, it may not do as well. But as we see, uh, it does quite well. So then I thought, what happens if I pass in pictures of my dogs? Now, my dogs are cute as hell, um, but they're a breed called Norwich Terriers, and it's, it's a fairly rare breed, and there are only like six or 700 puppies a year that, that are born. And so I thought, all right, well, maybe there wouldn't have been a lot of pictures of Norwich Terriers in those images. I, I don't know. Um, Norwich Terriers are quite similar to what are called Norfolk Terriers. The only difference is whether their ears prick up or flop over. They're often confused for Australian, terri or Australian Terriers. Um, and every once in a while, somebody will come up and say, oh, is that a Toto dog? And I say, no, 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 Toto is a Cairn Terrier. These are Norwich Terriers. Um, I wasn't like this, but I, I, I became like this. So I was surprised when I ran this and saw that not only does it strongly and confidently identify the dogs as being Norwich Terriers, it also makes the same, quote, mistakes that humans do, right? And says, oh, well, that could be a Norfolk Terrier, or it could be a Cairn Terrier, it could be an Australian Terrier. Um, and generally, my explanation for this is either people made mistakes in the training phase, right? They labeled images incorrectly and that has been captured in the model, or the models are so successful at like distinguishing what's unique about the breeds that those mathematical differences are, are sort of clustering in, in weird kind of ways as well. But uh, we can, you can play around with this. You can, you can build systems around using the image, the Inception V3 model to do your own image detection, uh, TensorFlow's got good support for, for that. One really amusing thing that came out of the um, SensorNet, or the uh, TensorFlow uh, Summit, 
is there was a Japanese guy who was not a machine learning expert per se, but he, um, he was a researcher, a biomedical researcher or something, and his parents were cucumber farmers, and they were getting older in age, and he said, what can I do to help you? Um, I'm imagining without actually going out and farming, um, was in the back of his head. And his mom said that the, the most time-consuming thing that they had to do was to sort the cucumbers, because different markets were more tolerant of funny shapes than others. And so he figured out what those shapes were, came up with training examples of images, used a Raspberry Pi and a couple of cameras and TensorFlow, and trained it to recognize and sort the cucumbers automatically. And so, again, this is somebody who did not have a background in this, but the problem was fairly well constrained. The tools, he understood how to use the tools. You can go through and, and build systems like this as well, right? You're not innovating necessarily in this space, but you're taking advantage of the tools that are available to, to build something that um, could help classify images um, into simple categories. So what do you do next? Once you understand TensorFlow, once you play around with it, once you get your models, um, looking at the various APIs, they've got tools for targeting Android and iOS uh, and Raspberry Pi. They're interested in moving into new mobile platforms. So if you have one that is not being met by their existing libraries, they're very open to, to you know, people asking for um, support for these platforms. And then you can start to build architectures where some portion of the code runs on the mobile platform, but you don't necessarily want to download the huge models. One of the things I didn't point out was the first time I ran this, it went through and downloaded the Inception V3 model, which is about a 90 uh, megabyte um, compressed format that I think expands to a couple hundred megabytes. So you're not going to want to have a bunch of those things necessarily showing up on your mobile phones. So using TensorFlow serving to serve up the models in a back-end capability to distributed architectures that want to take advantage of those models uh, is, is a useful way of supporting uh, more complex architectures. Cert, uh, TensorFlow serving also has support for operationalizing, optimizing, and doing the A-B model testing. So for a given set of tests, you could say, here's this particular input, and here's the result with this model, and here's the result with that model, to make sure that dropping new models into place is not going to, to tank your predictive results. Uh, recently, Google announced support for their research, uh, research, research cloud, so you can spin up cloud instances uh, with, with support for TensorFlow, uh, GPU-based computing, and things like that uh, for a fairly um, inexpensive approach. It's not generally available. There's, there's, I think, an application process to get access to it, but um, we're going to see more and more of those sorts of things um, showing up. Recently, distributed TensorFlow has gotten to be um, more prominent. It's always been part of the story, but the, the tooling did not make it as easily or accessible. Uh, so the idea is that you'll probably control your, your containers with uh, platforms like Kubernetes or something like that, but you also have the ability to programmatically start and stop these things within uh, TensorFlow graphs themselves. But beyond that, then, when you create a session, rather than creating a simple local session, you could use Google's binary gRPC protocol to, to target an instance that's running on a particular port on another um, machine. So you can say, I want this to run over there, or I want this to run against a, a cluster of things. Um, and you can even do things like do the, the training operation locally for a particular task of a particular job, and then say, schedule that um, to run against clusters targeting you know, particular dis distributions of how the data is being broken up. There's a lot of cool things going on in this space. Uh, as I said, the, the tutorials are getting better and more up, up to date to the APIs. We're building higher level abstractions on top of these lower level capabilities. Um, we have a wide variety of learning models and um, visualization tools and optimizers and things like that available to us. New things coming all the time, being able to take advantage of clusters of CPUs and multiple GPUs is largely managed for us by the, the framework. And then once you go through your training phase, generate your, your models, turning them into running code that you're able to keep into production and keep uh, happily and successfully making good predictions is all part of the TensorFlow ecosystem. 
So I, I encourage you to, to dig into it more. Um, as I said, my email address is here. F please feel free to contact me if you want to say, like, I've got a background in programming but not statistics. What's a good next step for me? Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to try to help push you in the right direction. So we have time for a couple of questions, if, if there are. Um, otherwise, um, yes? Um, off the top of my head, I don't know of an API function that would do that, but I believe I have seen people uh, build models that run until you hit a certain threshold. But as you see with a lot of these things, uh, at, you, know, you start to tail off you know, from a, a particular, after a, a certain number of epochs, you don't get any better based on the data that you have. So, Right, right. So you can you could you could build things that will do that as opposed to using the default, which is run for this number of, of epochs. Yes, uh, Google actually has quite a few models that you can download yourself. So image uh, Inception v3, some of the, the the text corpuses for like the Google News. Um, I don't know about marketplace yet, but there are websites and things that are that are. Clustering and, and generally, people are, are are happy to share their models, at least in, from the research community. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it, and. Uh...